My name is Emily Hackett, and I'm a first year student in the RECA master's program. I focus on soft power initiatives in the region, especially in the form of educational and cultural exchange, and I have a particular interest in Czech and Soviet history. I came to RECA to answer questions about the lasting impact and effectiveness of soft power initiatives in the region, especially now given severed educational partnerships with Russia and with other countries in the region wanting to move away from their role as a, Russian, a hub of Russian language learning. And I'm Sonia Gupta, a second year G2 in the RECA AM program. I specifically focus on the intersection of medicine and the region, investigating how cross-cultural social factors affect medical approaches and the evolution of healthcare systems in the region. Currently, my thesis focuses on Ukrainian refugee health underneath the Temporary Protection Directive. I came to the RECA program in order to get a better understanding of the language, people, medical approaches, and conditions in the Eurasia region. So far, I'm using what I've learned from the RECA program to help build up a medical student-run telehealth nonprofit that provides free telehealth services to Ukrainian refugees. After graduating from RECA, <laughs> I'll be heading to medical school, eventually becoming a physician, working to overcome global health challenges in the RECA region. This panel is the moment when we think about how the Russo-Ukrainian war has changed regional dynamics, and we have exactly the right speakers to help us do that. Oksana Shevil is an associate professor of comparative politics at Tufts University and director of the Tufts International Relations Program. Her research and teaching focus on the post-Soviet region, especially Ukraine and Russia, and nation building, identity politics, citizenship policies, memory politics, church-state relations, and democratization processes. Professor Shevil is co-author with Maria Popova of a very recent book on the root causes of the Russo-Ukrainian war entitled Russia and Ukraine, Entangled Histories, Diverging States. Professor Shevil is a member of the Ponars Eurasia Scholarly Network, a board member of the Shevchenko Scientific Society and an associate of both the Davis Center and the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. She holds a PhD in government from Harvard an MPhil in International Relations from the University of Cambridge, and a BA in English and French from Kyiv State University. Next up, we have Nargis Kostyanova, who is a senior fellow and director of the Program on Central Asia at the Davis Center. Prior to joining us, Professor Kostyanova was an associate professor at Kimap University in, Al in Almaty, Kazakhstan. She holds a PhD in International Cooperation Studies, from the Graduate School of International Development at Nagoya University in Japan. And her research focuses on Central Asian politics and security, Eurasian geopolitics, China's Belt and Road Initiative, governance in Central Asia, and the history of state making in Central Asia. Last but certainly not least, Professor Stephen Jones is director of the program on Georgian studies at the Davis Center. He taught at Mount Holyoke College for 20 years, beginning in 1989, and co-founded the master's program in modern Georgian history at Ilya State University in Tbilisi. He has written many books on Georgia, including The Birth of Modern Georgia, The First Georgian Republic and Its Successors, 1918 to 2010. I have also heard that his toasts in Georgian often reduce Georgians to tears. <laughs> Professor Jones received his PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science and is a foreign member of the Georgian Academy of Sciences. And last but not least, moderating this conversation is our fantastic Natasha Yefimova Trilling, the Davis Center's Director of Communications. She's an editor, writer, researcher, and Russian to English translator with more than a decade of journalism experience, most of it in the former Soviet Union. Before joining the Davis Center in 2023, Natasha edited the Harvard-based Russia Matters website since its launch in 2016. Natasha, over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you, Sonia. And 
Thank you to our incredibly resilient audience. I am so impressed that you, it's been a very long day. I'm so happy to have you here. We are going to try to frame this a little bit as a conversation. We're gonna to try to cover two really broad questions and uh, our speakers moving from west to east will try to, uh, to weigh in on those two questions. And the first of them, uh, you know, which stemming from the name of the panel is uh, how, what changes uh, the, the Russia's aggression against Ukraine has ushered in among its neighbors. It's no surprise that if we're seeing Russia's status in the world change, uh, then certainly among its neighbors, where it was undoubtedly the, the wealthiest of the former Soviet republics, those changes are uh, resonating even more powerfully and nowhere more so than in uh, Ukraine itself. And uh, Oksana, you wrote recently that if it weren't for Russia's invasion of Ukraine, then perhaps Ukrainian politics would have con continued to oscillate from pro-Western sentiment to pro-Russian sentiment on and on and on. But clearly we're seeing a much different situation now. Um, thank you, Natasha. Um, it's a pleasure to take part uh, in this panel and in this event. So I will start, um, as, you, as you were indicating, with the impact um, of the war uh, specifically on U in Ukraine and around Ukraine. Um, and I want to highlight what I consider to be one of the biggest paradoxes uh, of this invasion, which is Putin trying, going to war, to prevent what he called uh, the emergence of anti-Russian Ukraine um, and supposedly to return Ukraine to its quote-unquote correct identity Entity, um, as you know, being close to Russia, identifying with Russian interests and being in Russian uh, kind of geopolitical orbit. And the end result has been exactly the opposite. Um, so you, in Ukraine, since 2014, and especially since 2022, there have been processes that um, under normal circumstances, you know, in many countries could have been unfolded over decades or potentially even century and may not have even gotten to the point where, where they are. But in Ukraine, there have been profound shifts in a variety of um, areas um, in identity politics, in language practices and attitudes to language policy, in geopolitical orientations, um, attitudes towards the EU, attitudes towards NATO. And in every respect, Putin lost um, an inf influences and channels of influence that Russia had um, over Ukraine before. So I want to unpack that a little bit um, in a few minutes that I have. So if we think about Ukraine as it existed before um, the, the first um, round of Russian aggression into 2014, um, as Natasha was um, already um, alluding, there was very strong kind of Russia-friendly uh, sentiment and very large Russia-friendly, you know, we can call it pro-Russian, but I think kind of Russia-friendly is maybe more accurate, uh, constituency, right? So the electorate in the south and the east of Ukraine, which didn't disappear anywhere, was Euromaidan, right? Euromaidan brought a pro-Western government to Kyiv, but it didn't change the fact that this government was not widely supported um, by many people in the south and the east. And these people were still voters and in a democratic system they would have voted for you know Russia friendly pro-Russian political parties and this situation that existed in Ukraine uh, since 91 with kind of pro-Russian pro-Western presidents alternating in power drawing on the support from these different geographic parts of the country you know could have well continued for quite some time uh, if we think about other channels of influence Russia had in Ukraine the media right a lot of media both you know Russian media broadcasting in Ukraine and various oligarch owned Ukrainian media that broadcasted you know generally kind of Russia friendly messages, business networks against various oligarchs and their business dealings. Uh, the church, you know, again, the Russian, uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchy being the largest church um, in Ukraine and that kind of the Russian world message that has become, has been central in the messaging of this church. We can add infiltration of Ukrainian security services and sort of top echelons. So, you know, in, in a lot of areas, Russia had a lot of influence that it could have continued to exercise after 2014. But once Putin made this fateful decision to invade first, you know, annex Crimea and uh, support this uh, insurgency in the Donbass and ultimately go, f it was a full scale invasion, dramatic changes have taken place. Um, some 12% of the Ukrainian electorate was cut off already from voting back in 2014, which produced the government that basically became impossible to any sort of pro-Russian parties to, or president to occupy a leading position. It led to changes such as decommunization and sort of this very 
various change, uh, again, move away from Russia in identity politics. Um, and it also began to produce changes in public opinion. And these changes further accelerated dramatically after 2022. So I just want to show, by way of illustrating, some of the most profound changes that we have seen, right? So this is um, the attitudes towards NATO. Yes, the graph speaks for itself, right, in Ukraine. Uh, through Euromaidan, um, there was a minority support. We're talking about 25, you know, maybe 30 percent at best. And that really has cha changes um, dramatically. And this change also importantly affects southern and eastern regions of the country, which was completely unheard of before. It's slightly lower numbers there, but it's still clear majority support uh, for membership in NATO. Um, the same uh, situation if we uh, consider these geopolitical um, alternative projects of um, European Union as opposed to Russia-led uh, Eurasian Union, again, had close support, you know, sort of a balance there. Yes, EU may be slightly larger, but certainly not dominant majority. Now we can see, you know, there is a um, complete uh, change in attitudes there. Um, also consolidation of Ukrainian identity. So people, and this is the point that was made earlier, you know, I think Fiona Hill very aptly said that this kind of ascriptive notion that, you know, Russian speakers have certain identities was, you know, not never the case in Ukraine, even before 2014, but even more so, you know, more and more people come to identify as first and foremost Ukrainian. And also, since, since the invasion, we also begin to see more shifts towards Ukrainian language. Again, this story is very complex, as the earlier panel indicated, for many people in Ukraine, they are kind of who grow up used to speaking Russian. The switch to Ukrainian is, for a variety of reasons, is a complex thing, and Ukrainian society will continue to negotiate um, over you know, what to do with say, Russian speaking Ukrainian writers and so forth. Then we add to it, you know, this de-Russification, not just decommunization. So again, at every level, and I just want to show, you know, so this is um, also, as I, as I said, this phenomena that these attitudes now spread to the east and the south of the country is completely something that was not there before at all in 2014. And again, invasion makes that, that a reality. So, um, so the, you know, the, the conclusion from this um, is that Russia really lost its influence in and around Ukraine in a completely unprecedented extent. And paradoxically, it is the result of Putin's war that was meant to prevent exactly that, right? So that, I think, is something that is really, you know, something that we will think about and continue pondering about. And just to mention very briefly, since we're trying to talk about region more generally, not this similar process may be unfolding in Moldova, where, just like in Ukraine, Russian TV channels have been banned. Um, there is, it seems like there may be a brewing rebellion within the uh, Orthodox Church in Moldova, which uh, again, has been affiliated with the Russian Orthodox Church. Both of these things have also happened in Ukraine. So um, in the, maybe I'll, I'll end with this point that if we think about kind of looking towards the future, that this um, kind of Russia-led regional geopolitical project, at least including Ukraine and probably including Moldova, since both countries are also now candidates for EU membership, just cannot I mean, I personally can't imagine it existing other than through force, right? So if before there was this kind of EU was a center of influence and, you know, Russia and the region was in some way divided and m many countries were in the game. Yes, like the Baltics were out, you know, since the 90s, but where would Ukraine go, right? Where would Moldova go, Georgia, all these other places? And now I think, you know, again, as a consequence of Putin's invasion, we really see that that project, I think, um, he killed it, right? <laughs> again, very paradoxically. And I think it would be only through brute force that keeping of Ukraine in particular and uh, potentially other countries in the region in that sort of Russia-led um, geopolitical something um, would be possible. And of course, there are also implications of that that we will get to later, I'm sure. So I'll end here. Thank you so um, much, Jackson. I think, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so, you know, in, in this context, it's particularly interesting to note that as we move to the South Caucasus, which Stephen will tell us about, the, the situation we're seeing is a much more mixed bag, right? We have clearly uh, Armenia, for example, completely now openly saying that Russia is not a reliable partner and buying air defense systems from France, while Azerbaijan is perfectly willing to continue to work with Russia. And you have Georgia, which is fascinating because you have about 80% of the population wanting to join the EU and the government much more trying to sit on two chairs, as the saying goes. So, Stephen, if you could unpack that for us, we'd be very grateful. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, everybody. I, I hope you enjoyed the Georgian wine over lunch. Uh, those two, two wines, Katsitseli and Saparavi, 
probably are grown here, just to let you know that uh, this is one of Georgia's great exports, is uh, uh, the Georgian grape. It's here. It's up in the Finger Lakes and down in Virginia. So, um, yeah, to, to unpack this, this I mean, one of the reasons that Russia has been such a successful empire uh, in the South Caucasus and the North Caucasus is because of those internal divisions, right? Uh, the three major nation groups in the South Caucasus have different allegiances and different histories. So, for example, Azerbaijan clearly is aligned, uh, currently at least, with its co-cultural power, Turkey. Uh, Armenia doesn't know what it's doing right now, and this is perhaps one of the most ma serious and major shifts that we're seeing in, in the Caucasus, because it seems Russia can no longer fulfill its role as a security guarantor for Armenia. And amazingly, uh, we're seeing also a shift of public opinion in Armenia about this, not only from the leader, Nikolai Papashinyan, who has questioned really uh, such a long-standing alliance that Armenia has had with Russia, particularly over the last 30 years since independence, um, questioning whether this is, is the sort of alliance that is going to uh, maintain uh, uh, Armenia's security in the future. This, of course, this question is related to everything that's happened in Nagorno-Karabakh over, over the last 30 years. Um, Russia uh, was really quite a successful empire in the Caucasus. Uh, it was quite a successful empire elsewhere, too. Uh, it's also been quite a successful hegemon in the South Caucasus over the last 30 years. Um, it's been able to successfully manipulate uh, the differences between um, the peoples in the Caucasus and particularly uh, the, the, the conflicts that have emerged in the Caucasus. So, you know, very in Nagorno-Karabakh, for example, it supplied arms to both sides, to both Azerbaijan and, and to Armenia. Uh, and uh, um, really what, what interested Russia, what it successfully persisted in promoting was a frozen conflict in the Caucasus, which kept both these countries... In it, under its control. Um, that has changed. Uh, so the war, I, I, it's not exactly the war in Ukraine that has done this. this. This has been changing for some time. So the significant change perhaps was 2020 when there was the second Nagorno-Karabakh war which Azerbaijan won. And uh, Armenia appealed both to the Collective Security Treaty Organization, of which is a part and which Russia dominates, and got essentially no response, and appealed directly to Russia for aid, and essentially got none. And when the agreement finally came in November of 1920, a nine-point agreement, I think it's called, is it called the Bishkek Agreement, uh, in which uh, Russia took a major role in determining the status of the relationship between Azerbaijan and, and Armenia, uh, it, 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 Russia played no, played no particular role in protecting Armenian interests. So um, the Armenians are, are disillusioned. And uh, they're still fearful, of course, of the role of Turkey, um, in particular because Turkey has now aligned itself with Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, would not have won the war in 2020, probably without Turkish military advice and aid and training. And of course, it has much more money than Armenia to develop its military. Um, but uh, you know, this this uh, this really is quite a, a tectonic change. Now, the the, the question is. Is this going to last? Um, because you know we've seen past ruptures, let's say, in Russian power in the South Caucasus. Uh, we saw it, of course, with the revolution of 1917, 1918. Then uh, the South Caucasus became independent. 
uh, for two, three years, uh, but Russia came back, came back as a Soviet empire, let's say. Uh, and then, of course, we had 1991 when, again, the thought was, well, now, you know, the republics will get some sort of agency. They will be able to exercise uh, their own foreign policies. Uh, it's become, it was much more complicated than that. Russia successfully uh, managed those states, as I said, through, uh, through intervention in domestic politics and, and through its claims to, uh, to protect these countries from uh, external threats. Um, but again, of course, it came back. So, so the question is, I think, which is, you know, it's the question that um, that was raised earlier about whether this really is a turning point. Uh, is is it going to um, is it going to be um, a, a real shift? Uh, I, I think, and maybe we can talk about this in question time, I think that the, the, the answer is probably yes. I mean, this war has been so uh, uh, powerful in, 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 in eliminating uh, the many levers that Russia had over the South Caucasus. And, and the most important of all is the disillusionment that uh, has set in in the Caucasus, not only among the Armenians, but also among the Georgians, which is also quite an extraordinary change. The Georgians, despite the war in 2008, I, I, were, I wouldn't say they were tolerant of Russians, but they were not, uh, they were not so violently opposed to Russia, which is a quite different situation now. So, you know, I guess the, the, the question is, you know, uh, if it is a turning point, uh, how long will it last? My, I'm, I'm, I tend to be rather optimistic about it. I think it's, it's, it is a significant shift. Much of the shift, of course, will depend on what the West does and what other surrounding states do in terms of uh, um, uh, asserting their own interests in the caucus. So I'll stop and, there. And Sorry. certainly, yeah, we'll be uh, able to address that when we get so, to our yeah, second uh, question. And so, Nargis, you have an even more difficult situation because you must cover five countries in a very brief period. But again, there uh, we are seeing a very, very mixed bag, particularly economically. So many Central Asian countries are so reliant on remittances from Russia, obviously from, from migrant laborers. But now it's gotten much more complicated. Yeah. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, well, I'll continue the, the shift theme <laughs> that, uh, that my co panelists started. And uh, well, since it's the 75th anniversary, 7 plus 5 divided by 2 is 6. I'll, I'll, I'll six. <laughs> six. <laughs> the microphone is working. Six shifts, uh, four ups, and two downs. Um, and uh, the first shift that, uh, that we see in the region. Okay. Yeah, it's not recording. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so the, the first shift that we see in the region is the uh, the fee of Russia that is up for obvious reasons. Okay, I think now you can hear me. Yes. Um, so, well, uh, well, Russia is waging a full-fledged war on a fellow post-Soviet uh, post uh, state. And, um, well, for Kazakhstan, it's uh, particularly worrying. Um, there were several references today to Solzhenitsyn's uh, famous article, 1990 article, yes, uh, how to rebuild Russia, in which he says that uh, uh, northern and eastern parts of uh, Kazakhstan, that's a historical, historical Russia. And uh, he wasn't the only one who thought this way. And we still get sometimes uh, kind of uh, Russian opinion makers and even politicians who are uh, who say something along the, along these lines, and um, no wonder the, that uh, Central Asian states kind of uh, uh, try to uh, um, to uphold this principle that it was so fundamental for the post-Soviet security and political order, the principle of the existing uh, of the recognition of the existing borders at the time of the dissolution, right? Uh, and which which Russia obviously uh, vi violated, and that's why they uh, they abstain. Um, when uh, there is a vote at the General Assembly, uh, and I would say that uh, 
unlike for the global south, for Central Asian states, it's a different thing to abstain yeah, on on uh, on this kind of uh, this kind of vote. Except for Turkmenistan, Turkmenistan just doesn't show up uh, <laughs> <laughs> for the voting. Um, so Central Asian states have never been uh, fully relaxed, uh, and uh, they kind of they always knew that they needed to handle Russia Russia carefully. So okay, fear is up. The second uh, the second shift is that the prestige of Russia is down. Uh, and by prestige, uh, I mean uh, what actually Morgenthau uh, uh, meant, uh, the uh, respect uh, of its power yeah? uh, and gravitas. Um, so, and I would say Central Asian states are quite sensitive to uh, the hierarchies and features of the global social order. Maybe because we are newly independent states and we want to feed, maybe there is more value put on social order in general, but kind of, uh, we want to be uh, recognized, accepted, uh, respected, and there is understanding that the West is the top dog and the order maker uh, in the system. And uh, that's why they were so happy, you know, to have a summit with uh, uh, with uh, with Biden uh, on the sidelines of the General Assembly, and you know, these meetings are quite coveted, uh, and we see a lot of a lot of uh, summitry actually uh, later. So, how do we? How can we trace this decline in the prestige? Um, I would say it's quite subtle, yeah. Because on the one hand, if you look at the kind, kind of high-level meetings or the, the kind of normal, uh, well, um, high-level meetings, we see actually more meetings with Russian top officials than we had before before the war. Yeah, and uh, uh, Central Asian leaders dutifully, you know show up for all the like CSTO summit, the CIS and, 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 uh, and, and all that. Uh, but uh, for example, if we take the parade, yeah, the May parade uh, in 2022, May parade in 2023, um, 2023, they all in the end showed up, but they were dragging their feet until the last moment. Or like Kyrgyzstan's president Sadir Japarov actually confirmed in advance. Everybody else had to be like really, really strongly convinced. Yeah, and uh, two weeks later, ten days later, they went. They all went to Xi'an for a summit with uh, with President Xi, and they definitely didn't uh, didn't drag their feet. Yeah. Yeah, they were very happy to to go. So we see this kind of subtle, subtle shift with China becoming now kind of this regional power with a lot of gravitas. You know, so more reliable, more predictable, um, predictable, and so on. The third, uh, the third shift is the, that the importance of Central Asia for Russia and Russian citizens is up. Um, and well, politically, you need, uh, you need leaders to show up for your parades, <laughs> one, one thing, it, well, economically, and to vote and, uh, and all that. Economically, uh, well, the markets of Central Asia are more important now, yeah, because, well, the West is closing. Um, we see redirection of Russian gas, for example. Now, before Central Asian gas was flowing to Russia, now Russian gas is flowing to Central Asia, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, Central Asian migrants were going to Russia, and they're still in Russia. Yeah, uh, but now there is a Russian migration, substantial migration uh, to to the region. Uh, Russians are opening bank accounts, which is becoming uh, becoming a problem. And uh, now the Kazakh authorities will be trying to regulate it. It seems. Um, so, well, the trade is up, uh, and uh, and well. Something also we should mention is that uh, Central Asia is an important area for bypassing sanctions. That was, I think, mentioned uh, mentioned in the morning. So the importance of the region is up. Um, uh, Central Asia generally was taken for granted by by Russia. Yeah. So now there is a bit there is more attention, but I hope there will there will not be too much attention. Yeah, if you read the, <laughs> if you read um, uh, people like Sergei Garaganov or Trenin, and now it seems they're focusing on the global south, which I personally welcome. <laughs> yeah, uh, so let let kind of Central Asia be <laughs> as, it, as it is. So um, the fourth the fourth shift is uh, that the attractiveness of Russia led. Um, um, Regional cooperation projects, uh, CIS, CSTO, Eurasian Economic Union is down. Uh, they continue to meet and they continue to function, but there isn't much of substance that's, that is coming out of this. And as an example, I would give you the latest CIS summit in Bishkek. And the biggest deliverable of that summit was uh, the decision to create the, um, the International Russian Language Organization. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, uh, that will do God knows God knows what, but uh, probably will be opening schools and uh, and this kind of this kind of things. But you know, um, uh, and the, the the fifth shift is the eagerness of the countries of the region to diversify their security, political, and economic uh, economic ties. So it is up um, because. Well, Russian economy is now is toxic. Export uh, via Russia became problematic. Uh, Russia, for example, Kazakhstan's flow of uh, uh, of oil via Russia was disrupted four times during 2022. So, so you kind of you need to redirect, and there is a push for kind of fostering alternative uh, corridors. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the most hope is about the uh, the corridor to the west, the the Trans-Caspian Trans-Caspian corridor. Um, so, uh, so that's something that is also uh, also happening. And finally, the sixth uh, shift is the effort to foster regional cooperation and cohesion. It is up. I'm very happy about it. Uh, it's not uh, it's not a new thing, entirely new thing. It predates the invasion. So when Karimov died and Mirziyoyev became the president of Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbekistan started kind of opening up, normalizing relations with uh, with uh, with neighbors, and then that created conditions for kind of this push for regional cooperation. Then the pandemic again uh, emphasized the importance of having intra-regional uh, intra-regional ties, supply chains, and uh, and this kind of thing. And the war gave another boost, and I would say considerable boost. And if you listen to the speeches given by, by all the presidents, I would say, oh yeah, it's the geopolitical, geoeconomic situation is so so difficult. Uh, we really need to kind of pull, uh, pull our um, resources, uh, resources together so that there have been uh, annual consultation meetings. Uh, and uh, um, the recent one was in Dushanbe. Interestingly, attended by, uh, by a president of Uzbekistan President of uh, Azerbaijan, um, Aliyev. So, which is an like five Central Asian presidents plus uh, plus Aliyev, and um, and okay, I will just stop here because I think I'm okay. all over time. Well, wonderful, thank you so much, Nargis. This, this allows us to very smoothly transition to our next big question, which is, as always, what comes next and what big challenges and opportunities are you seeing in, in the countries that you're telling us about? And obviously, we'll again start with Oksana, because obviously Ukraine has the biggest challenges ahead, hopefully opportunities as well. And what do you see as the main ones? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I will try to, I mean, obviously, Ukraine has uh, many challenges and the course of the war is obviously the biggest one. And the, the, as we had discussion in the earlier panels, the potential dangers inherent in the decline of Western military assistance, or, you know, forcing or potentially forcing Ukraine to settle on some kind of land for peace deal, which as previous speakers mentioned, has uh, no support in the country. So it would have to be essentially imposed by force. And then all of the sort of instability, both domestically and I would say for European security and global security more broadly. But I want to focus focus on potential positive, because I think what these changes that um, has taken place in Ukraine with regard to identity and attitudes and sort of this rejection of any kind of pro-Russian Russian world type project and the shrinking of the electorate that used to support this agenda, I think opens possibility, and this is sort of cautious hypothesis on my part, but I think there are, there are reasons to uh, think about it this way more optimistically, to create kind of normal functioning democratic state. Um, what do I mean by this? So first of all, support for democracy in Ukraine um, is, can I go back in the... It's not. No, I think it's, it's, oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, um, in, in addition to these changes on, you know, NATO foreign policy, identity, and things like that, there has also been substantial increase in support for democracy. Uh, whenever it works, let me know. It's, it's the previous slide. It was the one with the green map. Yes. Um, I think that's the one, right? Yes. So preference for democracy as a political system is now at 94%. It is a consensus across the region. It is up from 76% before the invasion, right? Mm -hmm. And I think with this kind of disappearance, for lack of a better word, of political viability of any pro-Russian agenda, I think there is now a chance for Ukrainian political class, for political parties, for politicians, to create, say, something like resembling a normal party, party system, when parties would compete, you know, on the left-right axis, approaching the situation that we have in uh, normal democracies, uh, stable democracies. Because in Ukraine, up until uh, the, the war, 
usually this competition centered on identity issues. All these parties that were kind of really undistinguishable, they were all against oligarchs and they were all for like social well-being. But ultimately, sort of what it was is some of them were more pro-Russian and some of them were more pro-Western. And for many voters, this is how the decisions were made. And I think now with sort of any kind of, again, pro-Russian, I think, ticket being electorally hopeless, there is now a possibility for political parties to create, you know, sort of normal, what we would call democratic system underlying stable democracy. Additional reason to be optimistic that this might be the way Ukraine would head, um, again, assuming um, uh, the, you know, the events in the war itself would not be completely destabilizing, which may very well be, um, is the EU membership, right? Because the um, Ukraine now being a candidate for EU, uh, for, uh, for EU membership, if negotiations are open in the near future, which seems like they might be, again, doesn't mean Ukraine will join immediately, but in the course of these negotiations, this would be both a boost to democratic, for democratic civil society domestically, because before, when, say, civic activists were pushing for anti-corruption reforms, like what's in it, right? Like why should political class do it just to satisfy civil society? But now if that's a condition for entering the EU, I mean, that gives much more boost, you know, for domestic activists who are pushing for it. And also I think makes it more likely that these kinds of painful reforms would be implemented because there is a carrot at the end, right? And the same if we think about anything from minority rights, right, to human rights more generally, there are certain criteria for EU membership. And, you know, we see on the example of Baltic states, there has been various, you know, negotiations. We're getting here and sort of this crafting of various democratic institutions, but that's another, I think, factor that changed since the war that before Ukraine was not a candidate for EU membership, may not have been a candidate anytime soon. Now, you know, in part um, as a Western reaction to Russian aggression, now it is. So I think these two factors, um, you know, the, the possibility for support, greater support for democracy and possibility to create a normal sort of uh, left-right political spectrum of political parties competing on substantive issues would be um, a healthy thing for a demo democratic prospect and the, the facts of the EU membership. So I wanted to put a little bit of a positive spin on the consequences. Most of the consequences are not that positive, but I think these, uh, you know, are potentially so. Thank you, Oksana, very much. And so Stephen, we'll, we'll uh, come to your region and the, the same question, you know, what, what are the big opportunities and challenges going forward in light of this new reality? Well, you know, Russia uh, remains uh, on, on the border of the South Caucasus. It's, it's, it's a, a, you know, it's an asymmetrical relationship. It's a power that's not going to go away. Um, so there are still significant security challenges. Uh, internally also within each of these states, uh, there are you know, separatist movements, uh, in particular in Georgia, in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. These always present uh, uh, levers for Russia should it uh, require some, some sort of uh, provocation to uh, maintain its control. They have not gone away. There are new challenges also in terms of perhaps because of the reduction of Russian power in the North Caucasus, right? Uh, the North Caucasus is a potentially extremely unstable place. Um, so, you know, should Russian power diminish or should Russia face a, uh, some significant crisis as a result of the war? We don't know what's going to happen in the North Caucasus, but it's not going to be good for Georgia or Armenia, uh, probably. So, uh, there is still a continuing problem over uh, the relationship between Armenia and Azerbaijan because now Azerbaijan, which is 10 million people compared to Armenia, which is about 2.8, 2.9 million people, Azerbaijan is growing in terms of its population size. Armenia is diminishing. Georgia is diminishing. These are, these are issues related to internal economic problems in the most cases, massive uh, uh, migration, uh, also of course a massive in-migration of Russian uh, Russians uh, into Georgia and Armenia, which is causing its own problems. So there are, there are those those are all brewing, right? Um, however, so so one of these fundamental changes that has happened in the Caucasus is of course the fact that now Azerbaijan is the power, mm -hmm. right? It used to be. Uh, it used to be a balance at some level that, that Russia maintained between Armenia and Azerbaijan, but now Azerbaijan has the biggest army, the most powerful army, the largest population, right? It controls the oil and the gas. Uh, you know, 
this this is quite a different situation, and uh, and Turkey is now one of the major powers involved in the Caucasus. It's always wanted to be, and now the opportunity is there. That is going to be cemented by the opportunities now for uh, transit uh, across potentially across Armenia. This was agreed in the Nine Point Agreement. Uh, in November 2020, that uh, uh, that Azerbaijan would be able to connect with its railway or through oil and gas pipelines with Nakhichevan, right? Uh, which which is part of Azerbaijan but separated by uh, Armenia. Uh, you know this 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 axis of Azerbaijan and Turkey, which that development will will promote um, is, is quite a um, quite a significant one that's going to change the the geopolitics of the Caucasus um, but the advantages and I, I think you know that Nagis was talking about this is the the new uh, the, the new um, means of communication of transit they're opening up one of the problems always for Armenia in particular has been excluded from the, the transit corridor that goes through the Caucasus um, for political reasons. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, if, if there are serious peace negotiations going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and if those new lines of communication are built, this could lead to... Uh, what, what, the, uh, what the peoples in the South Caucasus have, have needed for a long time, and that is some greater cooperation, because this would give them greater independence uh, from Russia in particular and places like Iran. If the three republics cooperate and the lines of communication that potentially could come paradoxically out of this, out of this dispute, right, uh, could lead to um, some sort of region developing in the Caucasus, because up till now, there is really no region in the Caucasus because the three republics have had such disparate interests and disparate alliances, right? Azerbaijan with Turkey, Georgia looks to Europe, Armenia looks to Russia. You know, it's been very difficult to get any sort of uh, cooperation or union uh, developing and and you know the opportunities now I think are there. In addition to the, you know, the economic power that that's also going to give the Caucasus, it's going to boost their revenues if if this indeed does take place. And of course, China is very interested in in, in developing those links across the Caucasus because the Caucasus now has become part of the middle corridor for China. And Nagis, no doubt, will talk more about this. Uh, because of the diminishing uh, returns of the northern corridor, right, that goes through Russia. I mean, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a um, potentially. Uh, uh, I mean, it's still dominant in terms of the amount of freight that crosses the Eurasian continent. But the middle corridor now is certainly a potential for for China, especially if if those deep sea ports are built on the Black Sea coast. So, yeah. Well, I think that's a perfect segue to Central Asia, and we can we can op Im imagine the uh, middle corridor in its full length here. And I'm sure Nargis will speak about that. And oh, I have yes. a feeling I know why Aliyev was at the meeting of Central Asian yes. <laughs> leaders, because among other things, you know, uh, trying to get uh, Turkmenistan's gas out, for example, you know, Turkey and and Azerbaijan are both quite crucial to to pose giving an alternative yes. to Russia as a transit route as well. Yeah, and it's a friendly group, right? So yeah, yeah. everyone understands each other. You know. What I mean? Right. So um, in terms of challenges and opportunities, and that's a, the, the, the kind of, yeah, a combo. Um, the first one, I would say, is recalibrating relations with Russia without antagonizing, uh, antagonizing Russia. Uh, and um, at the core of uh, the kind of this recalibration, I would say, is uh, decoupling of our political elites from Russian uh, from Russian elites. Um, well, we know that traditionally um, Central Asian elites uh, had very tight links with the with the Russian elites and other post-Soviet elites, I would say. Um, and we know that um, most 
it's it has been Moscow's preferred way of kind of controlling controlling the near abroad. Is you know working with the uh, working with the local uh, local elites, and I would say these links worked both ways because on the one hand, yes, Moscow could draw on that, but but also Central Asians could draw uh, draw on on these links, and you know kind of. Uh, agree on things, get concessions from Russia, and so on. Kind of, they, they knew how to approach them. There was this f familiarity, uh, and uh, well, but it would be also important not to antagonize Russia. And there is kind of this, you know, strategic culture of handling Russia <laughs> with care. Uh, and I think we should kind of m maintain that. And uh, what what Stephen said, absolutely, you know. Uh, Russia is not, we're not moving away from Russia. We cannot change, we cannot change the geography. It can be disrupt. I mean, Russia will be back <laughs> sooner or later, most likely. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, so it's kind of, it, it is, it is important. Um, the second one is using this window of opportunity for diversification. We're interested in diversification and external powers are interested in supporting <laughs> these diversification uh, efforts. Um, yeah, and uh, well, uh, the, well, the EU uh, is ready to support uh, connectivity in the middle corridor and also the US is ready to support. This month there was a, I think there was already uh, a meeting uh, uh, on connectivity in you know, what I think it was, but 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 anyhow, the U.S. I mean, Central Asia within the C5 plus one uh, plus one framework. Uh, so the uh, there is this big hope that the middle corridor will develop, and the kind of the circumstances are right uh, because the northern corridor now kind of there is this uh, decrease. Like in 2022, 32 percent decrease in the volume um, Europe. Europe, China volume um, along the northern corridor, and um, well, Kazakh authorities said that there was an increase at the same time, 2.5 times increase in the volume across Kazakhstan. Yeah, um, so and the, the the EU commissioned the BRD to do a study on the sustainability on the sustainable kind of railway connection <laughs> yeah, um, ac across the Caspian and kind of if you see that the, the positive scenario if things go well you can see a really dramatic uh, dramatic increase in the volume um, but uh, there are also substantial substantial challenges and uh, the study shows that uh, it's not so much kind of the investments you can build this infrastructure but it's the soft kind of the soft infrastructure that, that is that is an issue and you know yeah, they, they need to get along better with each other. Basically, they need to coordinate more with each other. And I think it's a big moment, big chance for, for South Caucasus to mm -hmm. kind of increase mm -hmm. the cohesion. And it's a big window of opportunity for Central Asia to increase uh, increase the cohesion. Might be easier for Central Asia, but we have problems as well. Mm -hmm. like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan had armed conflicts mm -hmm. last summer, the summer before that. So so it will not be, it will not be easy, but uh, if we miss this chance, then... That will not be good. And last, I, in addition to this Russia kind of focused balancing act, now we see the emergence of China <laughs> focused balancing act, uh, act as well. Mm. Well, thank you very much. I, um, I, we were going to have a little lightning round to see if there was anything you wanted to mention that hasn't been mentioned, and we can do that. Or we can let's take the question. open up. I think yeah. we can. Yeah. So I think yeah, let's open up to the questions, and I will let the mic mavens handle that. Hello, thank you very much for this panel. My question is mostly to Nargis, but I think could be. Oh, sorry, I'm Isabel. I'm a Rika grad from a couple of years ago, now a PhD student in politics at Princeton, and um, my question is about sort of window of opportunity or not for potential democratization. Mostly I'm thinking about Central Asia, but perhaps elsewhere as well. You know, there's there seems to be on the one hand optimism, you know, you have Russia kind of taken away. But on the other hand, well, whereas in Moldova, the alternative is EU accession. This is obviously not a possibility in any way for the Central Asian countries and greater interregional Intra-regional cooperation also means potentially kind of autocrats scratching each other's backs. And then you have China. So I wonder, is, is there any window of opportunity for potential reform in the region or not? Shall we take many questions? Yeah, please. Oh, oh, okay. Um, oh, um, 
I, I don't see kind of democratization really on the agenda at the moment, but I would separate democratization from liberalization. I think these are overlapping trends, but they're not this, the same. And we see kind of, I think, a stronger liberalization trend in Kazakhstan and the weaker one in Uzbekistan, but, uh, but, but there is some movement in this direction. And if you look at the kind of the, the new constitutions that were adopted and, you know, kind of uh, various th things like the, the constitutional ban on de death sentence and, you know, kind of these rights and those rights, you know, so it's kind of things that are not political, you know, or <laughs> women's rights, children's rights, people with disabilities rights. Yeah. So, so there is positive, positive dynamic there. With democratization, there is some introduction of local, local elections, but definitely, you know, we're not speaking about like, you know, something anything significant significant in this regard. In Kyrgyzstan, we see the opposite trend. Unfortunately, in Tajikistan, also the situation is worsening and Turkmenistan was just, you know, in a stable way bad. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> is the so, yeah, I'll stop there. I mean, it's a very mixed, if, if I could just add, I, I think Tom uh, mentioned the Armenia, was it you, 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 you said, yeah. Uh, you know, it's a very mixed bag in terms of de democracy development in, in the South Caucasus. Um, Armenia has, a, I think most of the issues about democracy or liberalization really are more concerned with domestic issues. Although diminishing Russian influence in, in, in Armenia gives Pashinyan perhaps more leeway, more opportunities in terms of further democratization. Um, Georgia is unfortunately a backslider in that regard. Uh, you know, there's a lot of debate right now about whether Georgia is going to become part of, uh, be, be a candidate at least for the European Union. Should it do so, um, you know, clearly that would be an impetus for further democratization in Georgia. But it looks like the Georgian government is doing everything in its power to sabotage uh, it, its application. Um, and indeed, if it does, the, the interesting thing again about what we should be talking about, yes, clearly geopolitics is absolutely fascinating and important, but uh, I think sometimes when we talk about the caucus, we only see it as this sort of geopolitical place where contesting great powers are involved. But, you know, so many of the challenges and so many of the issues are really f domestically uh, generated, right? And mm -hmm. we, we should be looking at that. And that includes democracy, includes the economy, includes issues of poverty and inequality. These are all issues that are very much part of where these countries will go uh, in the future. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this wonderful talk. Uh, good, good afternoon. Thank you for this wonderful talk. My name is Anna Gambert. I'm a student uh, here at the college. And my question is about, um, well, earlier in, in the conversation, you mentioned Central Asia's recent you, you, earlier in the conference, you mentioned Central Asia's recent rapprochement with China. And um, my question is about how, how do we reconcile this with Russia's re parallel trend towards rapprochement with China? And how do we, how can we explain Russia's eagerness to, to, to sort of align itself with China, even though China is growing as kind of an opposing force to Russia in Central Asia? A sort of competition. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think the the uh, Russia was trying to prevent all the kind of not all, but um, like for example, gas exports. Well, exp you know, gas exports from Central Asia to Europe. Yeah. Russia puts so much effort into disrupting like all the projects, Transcaspian, Nabucco, and, and and so on. But it didn't prevent China from building. China and Central Asia of building the, the pipelines, you know, connect, connecting the region, which probably it regrets now. But uh, but um, but basically, I think the the idea was that oh, Central Asians have nowhere to go, you know, they they will need to lean on Russia, no no matter what, and kind of uh, look, do, do you really like China that much, you know? So uh, so um, the they didn't pay too much attention. I would say that they paid no attention, but they didn't pay too much attention to kind of this growing uh, China, Central Asia, uh, Central Asia cooperation. And uh, they kind of realized the, the scope and scale too late. 
Yeah. Um, and when um, Xi Jinping announced uh, announced uh, Silk Road, well, Silk Road Economic Belt Initiative in Kazakhstan in 2013, which later became Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Russia didn't like that. Yeah. And actually, it was only in 2015 when uh, C went, uh, you know, to Moscow they, and uh, they made this uh, statement on the linkage of the two projects, Eurasian Economic Union project, uh, Eurasian Economic Integration project and the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and Russia, Russia did it because it had basically little choice. It's pulled relations with the West. Yeah. So, um, so it, it had to go along with it. So basically, uh, basically, I think Russia weakened its own cards in vis-a-vis -vis China in the region. Um, you know, so um, so they they don't like it, but they can't they can't you know do much at this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Alexandra Vakru. I have a question for Oksana. So we often think of the region in terms of the Caucasus and Central Asia, and then there was Ukraine. And I'm wondering how Ukraine thinks about the Caucasus and Central Asia. If it's so focused right now on Europe and getting integrated into Europe that those countries are kind of less important, or if it sees that there is some potential for greater interaction there, uh, and if it has the capacity to be working on those relationships right now. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for this question. Um, I think Ukraine, I mean, sort of short answer would be that given the priorities of European integration and the need to fight the war and, you know, trying to some make overtures to the global south to sort of fight this Russian, uh, you know, we are anti-imperial power narrative that's, you know, was mentioned earlier. So it doesn't have that much sort of bandwidth to engage elsewhere. So I think what Ukrainian, Ukraine may be hoping that if it creates a successful precedent, right, of, say, successful integrating into the European Union, then maybe in Georgia things might change, right? I think Georgia in particular is something, again, you can see it in the narratives in the media and social media, that Ukrainians are both puzzled and kind of feel bad for the Georgians, right? <laughs> they are puzzled by the fact that, you know, Russia annexed part of the territory of Georgia, society, as you know, you said, 80% in favor of you, and yet you have this Russian government, like, how does that make any sense, right? And they're somewhat concerned. Um, and, you know, I think people who study the region, there was at least one good article written about it recently, that that might, might be Putin's plan for Ukraine if he can indeed outlast the West and force some sort of, the West would force some sort of unjust peace on Ukraine because it would not have support in the public. It would not be Zelensky's, you know, choice. But if it's somehow, I mean, I don't see quite how, but let's imagine if it did strong arm Zelensky into something like this, then it creates all this instability domestically. It creates this, like, blaming each other who's, you know, and then in these divisions, in this instability, that's exactly the kind of environment where Russia would fish for some sort of government like, you know, even it's really, I mean, you know, it's it's sort of, right. So, so, in, so in the way that when Ukraine is thinking about these other countries in the region, I think that's, you know, where, you know, where it is. So I think, the, the hope is that there would be successful democratization, European integration, you know, for Ukraine, and that that might produce these sort of positive externalities for the, in the Caucasus in particular for Georgia. And in the meantime, like, we don't want to end up like Georgia, what the hell happened there, right? So, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry, I have another question for Oksana. Fantastic panel. Um, it, it, oh, Elizabeth Wood, um, MIT and uh, Davis Center Associate. 94% um, uh, are in favor of democracy. It makes perfect sense to me, but I'm curious, uh, in the context of war, we're hearing about the front, we're hearing about the social problems. I haven't been hearing about the political uh, uh, scenes. And I don't, it, what can you tell us about, are there still ongoing reform efforts? What happened to decentralization? Do you come, you know, and um, uh, can, can reform be made or is it just all out for the war and re reform will wait till after the war? Yeah, this is actually quite, you know, I think uh, uh, amazing and positive and not very well discussed, you know, sorry, but there has been a lot of reforms going on in all sorts of areas from local reforms to, you know, to the local government reform to very 
serious anti-corruption measures, a lot of it comes in response to the EU, because the EU, when they said that, when gave Ukraine candidate status, they made certain conditions that Ukraine has to meet certain criteria before negotiations could be open. So that was a huge impetus. So despite, you know, this overarching need to fight, you know, to deal with the war and mobilize for the war effort, there have been, you know, various reform efforts going on um, in Ukraine. So that's, you know, that's, that's the positive, um, I think, um, in that. Um, and then, sorry, was it, what was your second part of your question? That was the main thing. Yeah. What, yeah. So, what kinds of parliamentary well, I think one challenge here is that, um, first of all, the election question, right? Because in the war, you can't hold elections, elections are scheduled, but that's in a way this democracy um, attitude. There was a poll just last week that showed that something like 60% want to wait for elections until after. So something like 70% want to change the government. So it's not the case that, but but also like over 70% support Zelensky. So it's, it's you know, it's complicated. Um, so, in a, but I think the, the, the way to interpret it is that first of all, there hasn't been domestic division in Ukraine. So when Putin says that the government is like, what did they say like just two days ago, that it is lost legitimacy or something like this, like, no, it hasn't lost legitimacy, you know, 70 plus percent continue to support Zelensky and have trust in the presidency and so forth. At the same time, this exactly because they don't have a carte blanche. They do want, people do want to have elections, you know, they want to have new government, but only after the war, right? So this sort of domestic, to your question, like is there domestic politics? Yes, there is a lot of it. Um, and this balance, again, it depends, I think, how the war goes to how long this balance of, on the one hand, maintaining unity and around, uh, like rally around the flag effect, at the same time, realizing the importance of continued reform and not giving the government car carte blanche to say like, you know, let's postpone this. So there is a lot of stuff goes on with like judiciary reform and anti-corruption and the, the declarations by officials. And again, a lot of it comes in the pressure from the EU. Is that on? Thank you everyone for a wonderful panel. Um, my name is Edward Charlton Jones. I'm a RICA Masters alum from 2013. Um, I currently work at a British law firm, Clifford Chance, where I focus on the development of energy infrastructure. And I was based in Istanbul for a while where I was working on one, one branch of the Southern Gas Corridor, taking Azeri gas to Italy, um, which has become you know, so much more in focus since, since the conflict. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, energy transition and how you see the impact of the conflict impacting energy transition goals in, in your regions. I, I'm aware this is a very open question, but in the light of increased focus on energy security and independence concerns, how do you how do you see that playing out? Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well, it's, it's it's an excellent question, and actually, there are a couple of people here who can give you know and uh, even a better <laughs> better re re response. Um, so, well, the. In Central Asia, all Central Asian governments made pledges on energy transition uh, and pretty pre, pre ambitious ones, maybe even excessively ambitious. But uh, but there is this kind of at least at the rhetoric level commitment, you know, um, at the regional level, and then they kind of. There are two champions, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, who are, who are pushing for it. That precedes uh, precedes the war, uh, but with the war, I would say the kind of the conversations intensified. Uh, the well, EU, um, EU Central Asia. Now, the other day, a few days ago, they they adopted um, a new roadmap for cooperation and the Green Deal, uh, decarbonization kind of. They, they are big themes, uh, big themes there. Uh, and uh, well, the, there are also discussions on critical minerals, critical materials, and uh, there is a U.S. Central Asia working, U.S. Kazakhstan, sorry, working group, and uh, the, there is EU Kazakhstan also kind of memorandum on cooperation, uh, cooperation in this in this area. So uh, I would say it's not kind of it got a boost, basically. Um, so, but but we are producers of fossil <laughs> fossil fuels. So kind of we hope it will last, you know, sufficiently right, that we can sell these things to European markets. 
did, did either of you want to comment? I wonder, I mean, if, if I can ask Oksana to comment a little bit on the question, just because, again, I know that right now it's too early to plan for anything, but we've been having a lot of discussions at the Davis Center of, you know, w w what is the process for thinking about rebuilding and the future of Ukraine and energy is such a crucial, going to be such a crucial question. I wonder if, is there bandwidth in Ukraine to even think about uh, the, a transition? Yeah, I mean, I don't follow energy politics, so I probably won't have any particular insight. But as far as like the rebuilding effort, I mean, two things here I would say are important. One, and I think it also came up in an early, earlier panels, Ukrainian economy proved to be incredibly resilient. So this is really something that I think is underappreciated. I can't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but there was a growth like in the last quarter, which, you know, I mean, there was obviously a huge decline. But there is this sort of retooling both of the policy kind of toolkit regulations for small business and so forth, and just sort of people managing to, I mean, I even know among my friends and relatives whose businesses sort of disappeared when the war started, they have somehow like reinvented themselves and, you know, are able to do things. So th this, I think, is something, it's hard to quantify. It also goes to this sort of will to fight, right? I sometimes talk to U.S. military people and they're like, we had all of these like number of tanks so forth, but how do you quantify that? Like you can't really, and I think with the economic one, like the, the numbers are important, but I think this sort of intangible kind of creativity and sometimes even like ironically sometimes corruption might even be helping these sorts of things right again I'm not advocating for corruption <laughs> um, but but with the energy um, I mean I, I you know Ukraine now obviously has a problem with this grain transit right uh, the, 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 the Black Sea but at the same time again quite amazingly they managed to recreate this grain corridor with uh, some of these military uh, successes in the Black Sea region when they took out this oil rig like Russian control of these oil rigs and of the Snake Island and there is now this you know, ships are sailing, even though Russia pulled out. So um, I don't, I can't really speak about kind of the oil and gas. So, you know, my colleagues would be more, um, but it is something that, yes, to, 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 you know, to your question, the, the reconstruction is definitely, you know, is not being postponed to think about it. it, it, it people are thinking about it very actively now. There is this McFall Yermak working group that talks about sanctions, also economic recovery. Kiev School of Economics is doing a lot. And of course, um, if we think about some sort of huge amounts of money potentially coming to Ukraine, how they're managed would be a big, you know, question that again, you know, civil society is thinking about now. There are people, you know, who work on it, who discuss whether or not it's better to channel this through the government, central government, local government, some sort of NGOs. So that's a very active discussion but I can't speak to the energy bit. Mostly. I'll just be very brief, if I may, about, about the position of the, of the Caucasus. Um, it, 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 they are, uh, well, Azerbaijan and Georgia in particular, um, you know, are on the map and attract investment, uh, largely because of the transit uh, uh, function that they have. Uh, they, they give them revenues. Um, they, they are, um, you know, they, they make the South Caucasus an important place. Uh, this is not like something that they're likely to, to give up on. And there is continuing development of uh, these uh, gas and pipelines and railways, which is very important to the development of the Middle Corridor. So most recently, China invested, I believe, in a thousand kilometer a railway line in Kazakhstan and um, they are also, there's a new uh, uh, Tbilisi Cars railway link that is going to be part of a functioning um, uh, middle corridor that was recently built in 2017, 2018. Um, but in white this middle corridor may be a little hyped, you know, because although it's going to knock some, some time off uh, the transit of goods from China to Europe, as Nagis pointed out, a lot has to be done to make this middle corridor functional. Uh, the software, the, the, the sort of soft structure you mentioned in terms of the, 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 the customs agreements, the tariff agreements, and then just the physical infrastructure, right? It's just, you know, you can clear all the passengers and the freight from these uh, railway lines, and you can get goods from Xi'an to Istanbul, across the Bosphorus into Europe, uh, but you can only do it probably at night, and you have to clear everything out in order to do it, right? It's a one-off thing. So, you know, to, to get this middle corridor really working yeah. 
it's it's uh, it's going to take a lot of time, and there are you know enormous obstacles in place. But yes, on the other hand, it yeah. will help the not only the Europe China <laughs> connection, but yeah. the connection between the regions. Yeah, true. You know, so that that's I think a big big value. Yeah. And can I say one thing on one thing, transition? and then we'll take one yeah. more question. Something to mention, I think it's important on energy transition, sorry, that is that China has become basically a very important actor in this regard. It's a champion, you know, energy transition champion in uh, in Central Asia. So, and we have an excellent policy paper written by Rika Elam Ipenjo. He's, how he's here uh, on, China's, uh, on China's engagement uh, China's clean energy engagement in Central Asia. Check it out. It's on our website. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, great. And then we'll take one more question and everyone gets rewarded with a break. Oksana, I have a question. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a possibility to ask the question. Sometimes it's much more easy to ask questions in that process with the presidents. Anyway, uh, Oksana, I have a question. Uh, uh, President Vladimir Zelensky, he's up for re-election in spring of 2024. Just recently, there was an article in the New York Times that there is a lot of pressure from the side of the Western donors uh, to run these elections. So my question, how is it possible to run elections in a war-torn country, given that 12 million people are outside of Ukraine in exile, uh, you know, in, you know, they are uh, refugees in different countries across the globe, 1 million people at the front lines, another million probably on the Russian-occupied territories, if not more. So is it feasible? And if it's not, what do you think, you know, what Zelensky is going to do with that? You know, how they're going to argue this and why uh, so-called Western donors that probably all reside but in Washington, D.C. are so uh, eager to see uh, elections in Ukraine now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jenya, for the question. But the short answer is no, I don't think it's feasible. And I think it's a mistake for the Western, you know, whichever politicians have pushed for it. I think it's a mistake. For the reasons that you mentioned, I think it's completely impossible to have anything resembling free elections. Moreover, I think it could be even more detrimental for democratic kind of prospects, because whatever the results, this, if, say, such elections were held, exactly because, you know, some many people will not be able to vote, you know, elections won't be able to be held in certain areas. So whoever ends up being elected is going to have reduced legitimacy from the start, because the argument would be that they didn't really win, you know, like somebody else should have won had these and these people voted. So I think it's a big mistake to be pushing, you know, uh, the, the Ukrainian government to hold elections under these conditions. What, what, why is it being done? I mean, in part, it probably because elections are such a central feature of a democratic system, right? It seems like, how can you really be a democracy and not have elections? That's sort of like, and I think that's probably some where the sentiment comes from. If one doesn't really think through, like, what does it really mean, right? And I think the way Zelensky has been responding, as to me, it seems like it's pretty reasonable. I mean, first of all, he said, like, okay, whoever is pushing for these elections, we don't have money for it to begin with. We can provide security. Are you willing to go sit in a trench in Avdiivka, right, and be like an election observer there? And by the way, you also have to pay, you know, for the election officials to go. So that's sort of already, you know, I think not an unreasonable provocative, maybe, but not an unreasonable thing to say. And secondly, given that the public opinion actually shows that most people won't do want to wait for the election, for, for the war to be over before elections are held. I think that also gives kind of strength to this argument on the Ukrainian government that that's a bad idea to do it. I think it would be harder if the opinion polls show that like 80% want to hold elections and Zelensky says, no, I'm not going to do it. I mean, that would be more, but luckily for him, you know, majority of the public opinion people agree that yes, that, that's just not feasible for the reasons that you mentioned. So there would be what, you know, decision made by, you know, taken by the Rada, to postpone elections? I'm not quite sure sort of what the constitutional, you know, exactly steps are, but I think now under martial law, constitution says you can't have elections anyway, right? So presumably as long as martial law remains in place, that sort of takes care of that, right? And again, to hold it, you would have to live the martial law, right? Like the Rada is probably not going to do it. So yeah, so I think, uh, I mean, again, as I said, I agree that that's a bad idea. And I think Zelensky has a good argument as to why that's a bad idea. And I think people in the West, you know, many of them are sort of just, it's kind of like almost knee-jerk reaction, like elections, democracy go together, right? We can't have democracy without elections. But then if you actually stop to think about it, this is really quite unprecedented, right? It's, um, so. 
Can I just add to, to what Oksana mm -hmm. said, just, just as a little footnote? I mean, I think elections, the model of parliamentary elections is increasingly irrelevant to the nature of the success of democracy in, in the South Caucasus. Armenia may be somewhat of an exception, but if you ask Georgians about elections, uh, most of them don't think that they, they really work. And it might be, uh, you know, partly because governments now particularly the, in, in Georgia, which is what I observe, you know, it has so much control over resources that, and it has, a, it faces an opposition that is totally incoherent, um, that, you know, it, it controls the electoral process. It's not just the day of the elections, it controls the electoral process one year before the elections ever take place because of its power of appointment and its it, its financial resources and so on. So I would argue that, you know, the, the, the West, and the agencies that deal with democracy building have to think about other ways to make governments accountable because uh, some of the examples in the Caucasus suggest that this model of, uh, of, a, of a majoritarian parliamentary democracy, for whatever reason, is not working in, in Georgia. Um, so on that note, as we all, it doesn't work in Azerbaijan. As, as we all look forward to 2024, 20, <laughs> we have plenty to think about here. Thank you all so much. Yeah.